one thing I did not mention in our announcements, as you find Psalms 35, is our mimic team is going to do the presentation they did last week again next week. So if you missed the mimic team presentation, you missed a, a pleasure. That was a wonderful presentation, and they will be presenting again in next Sunday morning service. Psalms chapter 35. Our psalmist says, Plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for my help. Also draw out the spear and stop those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let those be put to shame and brought to dishonor who seek after my life. Let those be turned back and brought to confusion who plot my hurt. Let them like chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery and let the angel of the Lord pursue them. For without cause they have hidden their net for me in a pit, which they have dug without cause for my life. Let destruction come upon him unexpectedly, and let his net that he has, writ has hidden catch himself. In that very destruction let him fall. And may my soul be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him? Yes, the poor and the needy from him who plunders him. Fierce witnesses rise up. They ask me things that I do not know. They reward me evil for good, to the sorrow of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humble myself with fasting, and my prayer would return to my own heart. I paced about as though he were my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one who mourns for his mother. But in my adversity, they rejoice and gather together. Uh, attackers gathered against me. I did not know it. They tore at me and, and did not cease. With ungodly mockers at feast, they gnashed at me with their teeth. How, Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue me from their destructions. My precious life from the lions. I will give you thanks in the great assembly. I will praise you among many people. Let them not rejoice over me who are wrongfully my enemies, nor let them weep with the eye who hate me without cause, for they do not speak peace. But they devise deceitful matters against the quiet ones in the land. They also open their mouths wide against me and say, Aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. This you have seen, O Lord. Do not keep silence. O Lord, do not be far from me. Stir up yourself and awake to my vindication, to my cause, my Lord, my God, and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Ah, so we, ha so we would have it. Let them not say, we have swallowed him up. Let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion, who rejoice at my hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor, who exalt themselves against me. Let them shout for joy and be glad, who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. Amen. Dear Lord, we come to you just once again, just thanking you for another wonderful day you have given us, Lord. We just thank you for this church, Lord, and just each and every one that makes it up, Lord. We just thank you for this time of the season, Lord. We just thank you so much for you just sending your son, dear Lord, that it's not all about the presence and things like that, Lord. It's, it's all about him coming and just bearing all the sins of the world for us, dear Lord. Lord, I ask that you would just... If there's anyone here that does not know you as their personal Savior, Lord, they just might not leave here without accepting you, dear Lord. Lord, I ask that you would just be with Brother Bruce. He brings the message, Lord. Just give him the words to speak and just help us just apply it to our lives, dear Lord. Now, Lord, I just ask you just to be with the many ones on the prayer list, Lord. Just reach down, touch them, just heal them. Be with the ones that have lost loved ones, Lord. Just feel that vacant spot in their lives, dear Lord. Now, Lord, I just ask you just to watch over us and care for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
How are y'all this morning? Good. I was looking out here earlier, and I certainly didn't see many of y'all. Y'all came out of the woodwork. <laughs> y'all were hiding. All right. Last week, Tanya talked about somebody in the nativity scene. Do you remember who it was? Mary. Mary. And Mary is the mother of who? Jesus. Jesus. That's right. Well, today, we're going to talk about Joseph and Jesus. Okay, and we'll put them up there in their spot in just a minute. All right, remember, Jesus was born in a stable, and a stable was where the animals were kept. Now, today we're going to talk about Joseph and Jesus. Now, I want to read to you from Matthew chapter 1, verses 19 through 24. And it says, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thy son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from the sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. All right, so we know um, God asked Joseph to do something. And I just read it in the Bible. What did he ask Joseph to do? To take Mary and not be afraid. That's right. That he had plans for them. Now I want to read a verse in Luke chapter 2 verses 6 and 7 to talk about baby Jesus. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. So we've talked about Mary, we've talked about Joseph, and we've talked about baby Jesus. Now next week y'all are going to learn something else from the nativity scene. All right, who remembers what candle Tanya lit last week? Purple. All right, she did light the purple. Do you remember what it represented? It represented Mary. Hope. hope. The word hope. Hope was the prophet's can candle because they waited in hope for baby Jesus to arrive. Now this Sunday, our word is faith. Do you know why it may be called faith? It does. All right. This is also called Bethlehem's candle. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. In Bethlehem. Uh, Micah had told that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, which was also the birthplace of King David. And it was also fate of a reminder that Mary and Joseph would journey to Bethlehem. All right. So let's light. Kindle faith. Okay. Let's see if I can work it. All right. Girls, can we let the boys go first today? Yeah, let's let the boys go first today. They've been really sweet to have good manners and let the girls go first, so we're going to let the boys go first today. We'll go back to girls next week, okay? All right. <laughs> Let's have our prayer. Before, we, before you go, let's have our prayer. 
Girls, I'll let you get yours after the prayer. Our Father, we just thank you so much for this time of the season. It's just something that we need to be reminded of that without the birth of Jesus, we wouldn't have the possibility of being saved by his wonderful grace. Just thank you. Help us to remember that this is the time to remember that Jesus was born to be our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Off to him this morning, number 245. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Let's all stand.
The name of this is Christmas Miracle Medley. Maybe. What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Who angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch our keeping? So bring him incense, gold, and myrrh. Come rich and poor to own him. The King of kings, salvation brings. Let loving hearts enthrone him. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Taste, taste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see him lay along. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by, yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Oh, Holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error. And the soul felt its birth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn.
Our purpose at Antioch Baptist Church is in all activities to glorify God as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to call saints to worship, and sinners to repentance. Thank you, choir and uh, musicians and uh, everyone for uh, singing today. If you have not noticed, uh, we have a nativity scene out in front of the church here. Uh, that nativity scene Tim and Dee put up, it was uh, her mo mother's nativity, mother and dad's nativity scene, and it was painted by Ms. Donise and Ms. Imogene. So uh, uh, if you haven't come by here at night or seen it posted on Facebook at night, it is a beautiful uh, depiction of the holiday season that we are involved in. So I would encourage you to be worth the ride if you would just ride by here at night uh, to see it. And if you can't do that, it is on Facebook, on our Facebook page that you can see that. And uh, Tim whispered in my ear as he passed by that we will be having a special presentation of the puppets on December the 23rd evening service. So December the 23rd, our evening service, our puppets, uh, will uh, present a presentation for us. So you may want to put that on the calendar. I know you may have planned on not being here, but that might change your mind. And so uh, uh, we encourage you uh, to come. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 26. We're going to pick up reading in verse 57. Matthew chapter 26, verse 57. They're working on it. I suggest you get your Bibles out. You will need them anyhow because I'm going to read some more uh, information as we get into the sermon time. So uh, I would encourage you. There it comes. All right. Matthew chapter 26, pick up in verse uh, 57. I'm going to read through verse 68. So if you found that in your copy of Scripture or going to read from the screens, please stand and honor the Word of God. And those who laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the soldiers were assembled, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat at the, uh, with the servants to see the inn. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at least two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest rose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ and the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. And here's the question. It's a question for them, and it's a question for us. What do you think? That'll make the difference in all of eternity how you answer that question. Then answer, they answered and said, He is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you. You may be seated. We have now come out of the garden. Jesus has had the confrontation there in the garden. Judas has kissed him. As Jesus uh, had uh, been asked who he was, he spoke in the great tetragram, I am. Uh, they had fallen back twice. Uh, the uh, ear of Malchus, the servant, had been cut off, the high priest circle. Jesus, by miracle, had healed uh, that. They had seen all of this. It had been in clear view. It had not been hidden. It was the dark of the night, but they had torches. They had lights. All of this could be seen, but man's heart is hardened. Uh, he, he will not and does not uh, see and hear the truth. What a wonderful thing for you to know if you've come to know Jesus Christ as Savior that you have taken upon yourself to hear. The Bible says over and over and over again, he that hath an ear, 
let him hear. I've told you that's not necessarily talking about this physical ear on the outside. That's a spiritual ear to hear the things of heaven. And here these folks were not hearing. Uh, they were a, a mass group of folks, uh, probably eight to 900 people. And uh, here they all had opportunity and they would not hear. The Bible says, and, that's the beginning of uh, verse 57, they laid hold of him. We need to stop just a minute because there's a lot going on in this passage. There's a lot to keep up with. And for purposes of the sermon this morning, I'm going to only look at one part of what you're seeing here, and I'm going to add some to that part. I'm going to pull Peter out of it. We're not going to talk about Peter and what happened to him or Judas and what happened to him. We'll be looking at that next Sunday. Uh, we're going to look at what uh, happened at the arrest and uh, the beginning of the trial of Jesus because I think those things are vitally important. You see, contrary to what is being said in the age in which you live in, the Bible has an order, and God has an order. God expects things to be done decently in order. As a matter of fact, he tells us through the Apostle Paul, God is not the author of confusion. But we live in a church age where we have become confused about what church is. God has an order for church, and it's time the church of the living God realized that and got back to doing church God's way. See, we live in the day and age, I believe, is what they lived in the day of the ages of Judges when the Bible says every man did what was right in his own sight. And we have decided today that church can be done the way we want it to be done. And I'm here to tell you that is a false view of what God intends for church to be. So, before I preach on the order of God, let me tell you what I think the order of the church ought to be. And I do so from the Word of God, not from my own point of view necessarily, though it is my point of view, but from the Word of God. You see, church was made, and it is a unique institution that God put here for us where we corporately come together, and with the gifts and talents God has given to us, we give praise back to God and come to the place where we corporately together worship God. Any group of folks that come together and claim themselves to be a church and do not come to use those gifts and talents God has given them, and during the process of that are not drawn to the throne of grace and do not come and worship the King of glory are not having church. Now let me tell you what I'm not saying. I'm not saying you have to come to church, to, uh, to church dressed in a suit and tie as I do every Sunday morning. I, I'm not saying you have to come and put on a certain apparel to come to church. Though I do believe as you come to church, you ought to present your best to the King. See, again, we do what's right in our own sight and what is convenient. I don't believe you ought to be in a beauty contest, though I would win. I don't believe... I, <clears throat> I don't believe uh, that, that you ought to be here to put on show and pretension. Uh, I, I'm not interested so much in, in, in those things. What should matter coming to church is that we come to church and we see that we come before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We recognize Him as that and worship Him as that. We say in our, uh, what we believe our church statement, that we come uh, uh, acknowledging that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and He draws the saints to worship and the sinners to repentance. Now, saints and sinners sometimes are both of us, right? Uh, but if we're going to come to worship, we've got to get the sinner out and get to the saint. And the saint comes through the blood of Jesus, not through our effort, not through our worth, not through our value, but because we've come and humbled ourselves and realized we are not capable of being what God has called us to be, but we have a God that is able to declare us capable. And as we do that, we humble ourselves, we bow before Him, and we worship Him in glory. See, today we've got a church that decided it wants to be more like the world, wants to uh, approval of the world. Uh, we, we, we live in a church today that, that no longer holds to the doctrinal truths of the Word of God. We hold a church today that really is not interested in worshiping the King. Most folks today are coming to church to worship themselves. That's the reason they argue about things that they argue about. When you get, your, you get your face set towards heaven and your heart bent beneath the burden of a sinner that I am 
and worshiping the great perfect king that he is and realize the only way that I can get there is that I come humbly to him and trust that he's done for me what I couldn't do for myself. I want to tell you, I quit worrying about the petty things and I start worshiping the king himself, the king of glory, and all of that filters away. And when that happens, it doesn't matter if you have much or you have little. It doesn't matter if you dress in your Sunday best or just your best. It doesn't matter if you come this morning hungry or it didn't matter if you come this morning full. It doesn't matter matter this morning if the music service you liked it or didn't like it. It doesn't matter whether you like the style of your Sunday school teacher or don't like the style of your Sunday school teacher. It doesn't matter whether you like the preacher or don't like the preacher. What matters, did you come before the king? I mean, it is, it is amazing to me to see the seed that the devil has sown inside the church of the living God and how much of it the church has gulped down and how few times we realize the purpose that we came to this building this morning was not to serve ourselves. We are here to serve the king. The reason that I know that we have this problem is I look out at the church and I see so little activity that is heavenward. I see so little activity that is intent on getting the approval of heaven. We're trying to get the approval of our own demented conscience. We want to somehow get by with our own evil ways and think God will put a band-aid on it and say it's okay. And I'm here to tell you, if you come before a holy you will come as a cleansed sinner. You will have confessed your sins, admitted your shortcomings, bowed low beneath the, the uh, King of kings and Lord of lords, and there you will find acceptance and there only. But folks want a shortcut today. Not just in this church, though it is certainly here among us, any of us, all of us. Folks want a shortcut. They think there's something other than than getting their heart right and worshiping the king that will make a church a church. And I'm here to tell you, nothing less will do. All are substitutes. The devil is in the business of substituting. I want to show you that from the passage this morning, or from the, 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 the scene before us this morning. So, let's see old devil at work and see if he might not sometimes be at work in our lives, though cleverly. He disguises himself as truth. The devil seldom comes with a horns and a pitchfork. The devil seldom comes in darkness and ugliness. He presents himself as truth and light. But when you expose him to the true light, he becomes the evil one that he is. So here he is at work in this passage before. As a matter of fact, let me show you how he's doing. Put your finger, your hand there if you've got your Bible open, and turn over a couple of books to the book of John and the 18th chapter. And I want to show you. See, God through the ages, for over a millennia, a thousand years, had been setting the, the uh, table, setting the picture, preparing the place for Jesus to come. And he was to come in a particular way. If Jesus did not fulfill Every promise and type that the Old Testament has, he was not Jesus of heaven. He might have been Jesus of Nazareth, but he wasn't the Son of God. And so he came to fulfill every particular point. And in doing so, he skipped none. See, we want to skip those things today, and we do so to our eternal damnation. So we find here in verse 12 of the 18th chapter, then the detachment of truths, troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. So here we see the first trap that was laid and God overruled with those. When an offering, a lamb, was made... 
he was required, the, the person making that offering, and especially if it was at Passover or if it was at uh, Yom Kippur, those two high days, the Day of Atonement and the Passover, the high priest was to examine the sacrifice that was brought. And he would have to look at that sacrifice and he would have to make sure that it was an acceptable sacrifice to be given. Well, old Satan had set the scene so they were two high priests. One was Caiaphas, we read about him over in the book of Matthew, but here is the true high priest, Annas. Uh, Annas uh, was given, see, when the high priest was instituted according to the Levitical system, he became a high priest for life. He was in perpetuity the high priest until he died. And then a new high priest rose up after him. But here the Romans, when they came and occupied uh, uh, Judea and Jerusalem, the Jews had become such pesky folks, had, had given so much problems, they realized that one place power lay in, in Israel, in Judaism, and that was in the high priest. He was the one that ruled the people. And they said, well, we'll put an end to this. We'll start picking the high priest. And what they did on an annual basis, they chose one from the Jewish uh, people to be the high priest. Uh, they followed some of the rules, but they didn't follow all the rules. And, and this year, and by the way, sometimes they would appoint him then year after year after year, depending on how well he served Rome. Well, this year, uh, Caiaphas, the son-in-law, of Annas was the high priest. As a matter of fact, he had already been the high priest for several years. And one of the things that uh, Caiaphas did, he controlled the courtyard uh, of the temple in Jerusalem. And in the courtyard was a place that they sold all of the animals, they sold all the sacrifice things. And you remember, uh, they made a mockery of the things of God. And uh, they would, uh, would take and extort money from, the, uh, from the, those coming to do sacrifice at Passover and the Day of Atonement. And Caiaphas was in charge of that. And guess who was enriching himself at that place? Caiaphas. As a matter of fact, he kept that spot because he bribed the Roman officials. And out of the money he made from the uh, 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 coin exchangers and those that sold uh, the animals, he became rich and enriched somebody in Rome that kept him in his spot. It was that place that Jesus had just walked in a little over a week before and found them doing that. He had made a, a, a whip out of some rope that he found there and he had driven the money changers and he had driven the sacrifice uh, sellers out of the temple area and said, this place has become a den of thieves. It should be a house of prayer. Now, what kind of terms do you think Jesus and Caiaphas is on? You're correct. So the devil was hoping that he would thwart the plan of God and have Jesus go from the garden to Caiaphas, the uh, anointed high priest of uh, Israel through Rome, but God had anointed Annas the high priest. And for the picture to be right, he had to go through Annas. And to the great uh, disdain, I bet, Satan behind the scenes looking, he said, wait a minute, y'all weren't supposed to do that, but... The Bible says they gathered together and they brought him before Annas. See, there's a right way to do things and God never skips a part. That's a right way to serve God. Did you know that? You can skip some of it and many folks do. But I will tell you, you will do so to your own harm. The Bible says you ought to serve God with a whole heart. You ought to give him everything. To give him less than that is to say there's somebody that you think is greater than him. To give God, to skip the part. See, today, every, raise your hand if you want to go to heaven. Go ahead, raise your hand. If you don't want to go to heaven, you're in trouble. Raise your hand if you want to go to heaven. Yes, sir, raise. you want to go to heaven. Yes, sir. Are you getting a, uh, a group up right now? Don't know. Could be. But see, how many folks want to suffer for Jesus right now? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on that. How many folks want to give something up for Jesus? See, we want, we want the privilege, but we don't want the cost. Uh, we give so very little to him. It is amazing that we do. We were not even willing to give our time to him. 
Folks want to go to heaven, but they don't want to study their Bible. Today, according to a survey by Barner, in a country where there are Bibles per capita, you know what that means? In every household, if there's two folks, there's 12 Bibles. That's an average. Some have more, some have less. But in, when, we, when, when, they, not we, when they go and ask questions to folks like you in churches, simple Bible questions, today the, the, the nature of Bible illiteracy is as great as it is, or worse than it has ever been. People can't answer simple questions about the Bible. People don't know who came first, Noah or Job, David or Abraham. Simple questions. And yet we have the greatest advantage to study and know the Bible of any generation that has ever been. You know why we don't know? We don't take the time. We don't take the time. It is, listen, I'm helping this morning. I know it sounds judgmental and I know it sounds tough, but I'm trying to help. The doctor is judgmental when he walks into the room and says, you have a tumor. He just made a judgment, didn't he? And he says, and I'm going to cut that tumor out. That wasn't welcome news, was it? But he's telling you what is good for you. And he's not being mean. He's just telling you the truth. You want him to walk up to you and say, well, that little problem you're having, there's nothing to it. Just ignore it a while longer. And if it gets bad enough, come back and see me. When I come back and see him, I'm not going to be happy with him when he tells me he could have done something earlier. I want to know the truth. I want to know the truth now. The Bible says we can know the truth. We can study our Bibles. You know one of the, one of the best ways to start studying your Bible? We have this... Uh, we just started it, so I realize many of you don't know about it. But I want you to know about it so that you can take advantage of it. It's not We're going to do it free for a while. We may start charging after some period of time. But we have a study group on Sunday mornings before this service. It's called Sunday School. And we've got folks that have volunteered to come and teach that class. And you can sit there in a small group of folks, and they will teach you, and they will let you ask questions. Now, I realize it's new, and so it's going to take us a little while to get everything. We'll have a few bumps in the road. But you come. We'll have it next Sunday morning. And I promise you, you'll learn. That's one. Just give a little time up. We don't do like your job. Your job says be there at 7 o'clock. Punch your clock. We don't do that to you. We'll let you come a few minutes late. Most do. Right, Brother Bill? And we're going to start at a quarter to ten. We're going to give you an extra two hours that your job doesn't give you on Sunday morning so you can sleep in and have a good breakfast and then come and learn something about the Bible. Man, if I was you, I'd go tell everybody I know about that. And uh, we're thinking about starting something on Sunday night. Where you come and we sing and I preach. And uh, you can come then. And if that goes over good, and we hope it will, we're thinking about doing something on Wednesday night. So there's opportunities for you to, I, I'm, I know I'm being tongue-in-cheek, I'm just trying to not drill on you too hard. But you know something, I think you ought to do those things, but what that will cause will help you, then if you will start reading your Bible a little bit every day. Don't read any more than you can understand. And if that part is confusing and you don't understand it, mark it, go to another spot, and then on Sunday morning when you come to your Sunday school class, ask somebody there. They will help you. If they can't, come ask me. And I'll go see if I can find the answer somewhere. See, see <clears throat> this is what is wrong with the church. I, I, I am listening as I, to, to just to our Southern Baptist denomination. And I'm hearing from those how many baptisms we're not having. I'm hearing how many folks we're not having. 
I'm hearing about those things. And they're wondering what new program we need to start. I want to tell you, the truth of the matter, we don't need to start a new program. We need new hearts. We need folks that come to church for the right reasons that hasn't skipped a step. So um, Jesus chose not, let me see, show you what happened to Jesus when he chose not to skip a step. Skip down to verse 19. It says, Then Annas, the high priest, asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. So he says, what are you talking about now? That was a trick question. They wanted Jesus to testify of himself, and they could say, Aha, you just testify. You say you're this. Nobody else does. These folks did not have Jesus' interest at heart. You say, well, I skipped that step because it just looked too hard for me. I want to tell you, this is a pretty hard step Jesus has taken. It would have been a lot better to skip this one in the next two or three, including the cross. But Jesus loved his Father enough. Remember, Jesus said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass. If there's another way, let's do it. I don't want to be separated from you. And so, um, so uh, here Jesus chooses not to do that. Jesus chooses to take God's way. I'm here to tell you this morning, take God's way. It may be difficult, but it will be best. And there will be some of us along the road with you. Jesus said, I didn't do any of these things in secret. As a matter of fact, many of those folks, remember, they sent out folks out of the, uh, from the Jews, from the leaders, out to see what Jesus was saying. And then they'd report back to them. So they already knew what he was saying. They just, just didn't believe it. He says, you ask those who heard about me, you see what I've said. And when he said those things, one of the folks standing around him struck him. Now, here the, the, the Bible says struck him with his hand. The Bible prophesies that in that hand would be a rod. And some of the uh, commentaries in the margins tell us in that hand, this man most likely had a rod. And that would... That would by the folks that would have been standing there, most would have had a rod in their hand. That was a symbol of their authority. He was standing there with the high priest, Annas, and his con cohorts around him. And those folks, you've seen them in the Bible pictures, the high priest would have had an elaborate uh, uh, stick in, in his stand, and he would have been insulted as I call it a stick. And um, I hope he's listening. He's not. And... Um, and then others would have had smaller canes or sticks in their hands. And one of them, in the palm of his hand, takes and just slaps it across the face of your Savior. Now here is the definition of meekness. Power, extreme power, under control. He says, do you answer the high priest like this? Now listen. I don't have the meekness Jesus had because you know what I would have done. I can tell you what I would have done. He had the power to say, be gone. And that fellow would have wound up in hell just like this. He had that power. He had that ability. He was the God of heaven. He spoke the worlds into existence. He has the power that when we do not accept him and turn him away to send us to an everlasting hell. But he loves us. The Bible says, for God so loved you and God so loved me that he gave willingly his only begotten son. And here in front of you is that son giving himself. He did not have to. He had undeterminable power. Power uh, without end. And yet he stood there and Jesus looked at him and said, If I have spoken evil, bring it up. But if not, why do you strike me? At that place, Anna says, well, I've had enough of this. We better send him over to Caiaphas. He has less scruples than I have. I'm standing here as the high priest. I can't do what's necessary. We've already found him guilty. And Caiaphas has already said, uh, better that this one man die than all of us. He was a prophet, by the way. Well, that's exactly what Jesus did. For I want to tell you, everybody in this room deserve to die and spend eternity separated from God. Every one of us. None of us are good enough. None righteous. No, not one, the Bible says. Nobody. Jesus did so. And so we're back now into the book of Matthew. Hallelujah. 
he might finish. So now they lead him away from Anais over to where the Sanhedrin is meeting. There the elders are. There, there, there the esteemed of Israel are. Probably not all of them because they've done this at night. And we know some of the Sanhedrin were sympathetic at least and would come to know Jesus as Savior. We know Nicodemus would. We, we, we know uh, Joseph of Arimathea would. So most likely they are not there. They've gathered cohorts, their friends, those that agree with them there. And so they gather them around. And so the Bible says that the devil, having not succeeded in, in skipping a spot, he says, well, we're still going to get rid of this fellow. He says, we'll bring some false witnesses up. And the Bible here says they brought witness after witness after witness, but they could not agree together. They brought all kinds of accusations against Jesus, but they could not agree with the other. The two finally stood up and said, this fellow says, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, you destroy this temple and I'll raise it up. In three days he wasn't talking about that piece of stone he was talking about his flesh and blood he was talking about life they failed to see that and these folks uh, said uh, false witness against the king of glory and I want to tell you if you say anything that's not truth and righteousness against Jesus Christ it's false testimony the high priest rose up in his pomposity stood in his full garb here in the middle of the night. We're probably at 3 o'clock or so, Friday morning. In all of his authority, in all of that, he says, are you going to answer nothing? No, he says these things not respectfully, folks. He's got sarcasm and hate dripping from him. What is it these men testify against you? Jesus let his guilt sink in. Our high priest answered and said to him, All right, buddy, here it is. And here it is, folks. Here it is. I'm almost done. Here it is. He asked the question. He said, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Eternity hinges on that question. Is Jesus who he said he was? Is he indeed the Christ, the Messiah, the prophesied one? The high priest asked the question that every single human being should ask. Is this man Jesus who he says he is? Jesus for the first real time. Most times he avoided this question. Why? He would say it. You could see the answer as we go through there. But most times, he was not bearing testimony of himself. You should have been able to see who he was. I mean, a man can do the things that Jesus did. You ought to know that. But now ask directly by the high priest and being the sacrifice. He makes the declaration of the reason that he is coming to the cross. He says, it is as you said. Now, it, the high priest ought to consider pretty quick. If this man is who he says he is, I better get straight right now. If, if this is true, what I've heard about him, at least I ought to try to find out the truth. And I tell you this morning, at least you ought to try to find out the truth. But, but he says, nevertheless, I say to you, I'm, Jesus might not have been in quite much trouble if he just stopped. But now was not the time to stop. He says, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Whew. You, did you see what happened here? He was being judged by Caiaphas, by the Jewish authorities. But he looks at them and says, for this moment... I like to use the term the Son of Man, his favorite term for himself, because he identified with you and me. He says, you for the moment are sitting in judgment of me, but guess what you ought to reckon? There's coming a day when I'm going to come from the eastern skies, I'm going to split the clouds, not as a tiny baby in a manger, not as a growing boy, not as a prophet, <clears throat> not, not as the, as, uh, here as, the, uh, as a dying Savior. I'm coming one day as the determinate judge myself. What he said is here. 
what, what should be clear for a voice that, that is listening, for ears that have, have the ability to hear is, I am the judge, and you will one day answer to me. Here you are adjuring me by the name of the living God, and I am the living God. Oh, I want to tell you, if the high priest had any sense, the hair on the back of his neck would have stood up. He'd have fallen at the feet of the King of kings and Lord of lords and said, Welcome home, Savior. And I want to tell you today, for those that hear this story that we have of a baby in a manger and a Savior going to the cross, if you have ears to hear, I want to tell you this morning, you ought to fall at the, knee, at the feet of the King of glory and worship Him with all that you have. Don't skip the step. Don't skip the step. Worship the king and so the high priest immediately sins he rips his robe it was absolutely forbidden that the high priest himself should tear his garment it was a holy garment from time to time we see in the bible where folks will rip their garments in protest to something but it was forbidden that the high priest should do so. And here we see in the depths of his sin, failing to see who the Savior is, he in the presence of the king rips his robe and seals, I believe, his fate. He says, he has spoken blasphemy. I want to tell you, if he's not the king, he did speak blasphemy. If he is not God himself, he just spoke blasphemy. He just declared himself to be the chosen Messiah, the one that had been predicted now for over 2,000 years, or even from the garden, if you want to take it that far back. If he was not that appointed one, he was a blasphemer. He says, what further need do we have of witnesses? I'm telling you this morning, you don't have any further needs. All you need to do is believe what he says and that who he is. Look now, we have heard this blasphemy. What do you think of it? What do you think of it? Is he who he says he is? Or if he's not? <clears throat> if he is, you are deserving of death. If he's not, he's deserving of death. Do you believe him? Is he real to you? I want to tell you, listen. <clears throat> if he is real to you, if he is who he says he is, the only way to respond is, is give all you have to him, unreservedly. This morning, make a commitment. If he is the king of glory, if he is the Messiah, if he is the Savior, you can do no less than worship him with all your being. If not, you have an idol. And that idol is you. If you put you and your desires and your wants, and your feelings, ahead of giving your all, you are an idol worshiper. Oh, you may not have some little trinket up on your mantle. No, you are your idol. You pamper you. You let yourself do the things that you let yourself do. You do not guard your tongue. You do not watch your steps. You do not discipline your eyes. You're the idol. And when, G when you're the idol, Jesus is not king. Finally, it says, in recognition of their belief that this man was a blasphemer, it says they began to spit on him. That was the lowest form of degradation. I'll be honest with you today. You spit on me going out that back door. I mean, you fit in our problem. I wouldn't try it. I might be old and decrepit, but I'll give it my all. Your spit is what you spit on the ground. It's worthless. And here, they value the life of Jesus it's just like speeding on the ground. I want to tell you today, I am sad to say this. So many folks that call themselves Christians value his life 
about the son. You have no thought for him at all, except when an occasional twinge of conscience bothers them. And by now, many have become so callous and conscious have become so seared. That happens seldom. They spat in his face and beat him and struck him with their hands. And then they said, hmm, so you're the Christ. Tell who just hit you. Mocking. I'm here to tell you, a person that says he knows and loves Christ and does not follow him and give his heart and life to him is mocking Jesus. Join the crowd. Join the crowd. So we have a decision this morning. Which crowd do you want to be in? Us hypocrites that love Jesus, fall on our face, have to be picked up, but follow him with what we have. I'm not hey, hey. I'm not saying we're perfect. We are not perfect. I hate to b burst your bubble. There's nobody in this room perfect. You have not attained it yet. You look down your nose at somebody else and think you're better than them. You just committed about the biggest sin you can commit. I include myself in that. But I want to tell you, I found Jesus worth following. And I've committed to follow him the very best I can and to do less is to spit in his face father I cannot begin to imagine what it must have been like on that day you who were giving everything you had the very life of your dear one and only son to buy my redemption. And in that holy place, with the high priest of Israel standing, having asked the question, they spat in his face. They beat him. They ridiculed you. They mocked you and asked you, are you really? chosen Messiah help us not to be part of that crowd even though we fall so short help us to stand with you not skip a step but to be that people you call us to be cause conviction to fall on our hearts cause saints to worship and sinners to repent we pray in Jesus name Amen sweet